Hi, everyone. This is Yael Averbush West, and I want to welcome you to my new show, Football Americana, a 90 Min podcast. My first guest is my good friend, Heather O'Reilly. Join us for a conversation about American soccer culture, 90s nostalgia, her time at Arsenal, and much more. This episode was recorded on September 3rd, 2021. Very excited to talk to my great friend and also a little bit of a soccer legend, Heather O'Reilly, also called Heyo, for those of you who don't know, based on her initials, Heather Ann O'Reilly. So uh, Heyo uh, has been a U.S. women's national team, literally legend, from 2002 to 2016 with 231 caps, three Olympic gold medals, World Cup champion, the list goes on and on, but the one that's not on Wikipedia, probably her biggest accomplishment is that as a child, we both grew up in New Jersey. And in my journal, I had a, this list of New Jersey soccer players who I was going to get better than. And Heather's name never got crossed off my list. <laughs> so it's not in her official bio, but it's probably her biggest accomplishment. So really oh, excited for this conversation. Um, if you want to start off, Heather, I, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about your youth soccer upbringing in New Jersey and what that was like. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This is uh, fantastic. And I, I heard I'm the first guest. So I'm very honored. Um, so yeah, I grew up in New Jersey and I feel like with so many stories of professional players, particularly in Europe, uh, men's, women's players, South America, the, the story is a, a lot of the same. It's, it's the rags to riches story. Um, and I can't say that I fall into that in terms of, you know, growing up in, in a tough environment. I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey. I always had um, a soccer uniform to play in. I had my mom in the soccer van dri driving me to the field, remembering my water bottle, that whole thing. So I kind of grew up um, sort of the beneficiary, I think, of uh, generations before me. So I really always kind of um, appreciate that and certainly don't take that for granted. But I, I did grow up in central New Jersey. I think that there was a combined factor of one, my town just really emphasizing soccer. Uh, there was a lot of immigrants, uh, I think, from Europe that were soccer coaches in that area. So I feel like uh, between like businesses like UK Elite and a lot of uh, British companies that came over and did soccer camps and uh, Irish coaches, usually all men. Um, would be my coaches. So I had a really fantastic upbringing, um, first playing for my town team and then um, playing for what was known as PDA or what is known as PDA now, which is actually the same club that Tobin Heath came out of as well. So I feel, uh, like I said, very fortunate that I had a, a line of really fabulous mentors um, that sort of guided me in my soccer journey. I was a multi-sport athlete in New Jersey. I played basketball as well. And I think that that was really important for me just in terms of staying fresh. And I never burned out from soccer because I just love the game so much. But I do think that it was probably good for me to switch my mindset and from a athletic uh, platform to sort of get a different, I don't know, a different look. Um, and as you know, yeah, yeah, the, the winters in uh, New Jersey are tough. So it was it was fun to have indoor soccer as an option, but also to have basketball as a way for me to, you know, stay fit and have a new group of friends and things like that. Uh, so yeah, I have really fond memories of growing up in New Jersey. I think there was a lot of opportunities for us and, and, you know, yeah, yeah. Like we got to play New Jersey ODP together. Yeah. L basically was like the only player that was able to play up in her, uh, her age group. She was born in 1986 and I was born in 1985. And I was always told, no, you got to stay in your age group. You got to stay in your age group. And then Yael basically says, like, she's not going to play ODP unless she gets to play up. Then all of a sudden she's with us. We're like, who is this girl? Who's this 86 that thinks that she can battle it out with us? But uh, she did OK, so we couldn't really say anything. For the record, there's a little more to that story, but I do sense that you're still a little bit bitter about that. <laughs> um, but, you know, going into something you mentioned, this, you know, your soccer upbringing is, is in a lot of ways very similar to mine and talking about the diversity of coaches and influences in New Jersey in particular. Um, would you say that that were you a soccer fan from the beginning? Were you just a participant? Like, did you were you able to watch soccer? Obviously, it was a different scene. There wasn't the access we have now. So how did you interact with the game on that in that sense? Um, I would say I was pretty down the middle. Um, I think my my 
family really introduced me a lot to the game. I have three older brothers. Uh, my father ran track at Villanova University, so a very like sports oriented family. And so, for instance, when the '94 Men's World Cup was being played, I was nine years old, and I have very vivid memories of going to the World Cup. Um, I went actually to the Italy versus Ireland game that was held at Giant Stadium, and O'Reilly, of course, has some Irish ancestry. So I remember being so proud. I had like the Ireland flag painted on my cheeks and brought a soccer ball and got to juggle around in the parking lot and tailgated. And I think that was like the first time I was really brought into the global um the global environment of, of football. Um, and I, and I owe a lot to my parents for, for bringing us to that same thing in the 99 world cup, just a few years later. Um, I'm, I'm a spectator at the 99 women's world cup at giant stadium. I see Mia ham score a fantastic goal. All of a sudden now this crazy atmosphere that I'm around is, is actually for women's soccer. And I remember as a 14 year old at this point, Um, actually getting like emotional at this match, like looking down at the field, um, hearing the national anthem, seeing Mia Hamm, um, seeing all these stars. And I got like teary eyed because I wanted it so bad. I was like, I want to do that. And that was sort of a big time of differentiation, I think, between me and, and my peers, because there was some players there that didn't, that were just there for the you know, the pretzel at halftime or to see NSYNC perform the national anthem, which was a great performance. Uh, Justin Timberlake, what? He, I mean, he, I think that he's an underappreciated artist of our generation. Um, I, I was at that game as well. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. And so, yeah, of course, that those are the things we remember. But I think that my point being is that was an age where I started to want to take it to the next level, where a lot of my like school friends or club friends um, they weren't willing to commit um, the same amount that, that I was. So, um, and then my parents were, uh, we were season ticket holders to the Metro stars, the original MLS team in the New York, New Jersey area. So again, we went to Metro stars games, Rutgers university games, some Princeton games. So I owe a lot to my dad actually for being the one to kind of introduce me to the sport at, at a lot of levels, but no, I don't, I don't think I knew what like, arsenal was at that point i don't think i really had a understanding of like what pele had did and maradona and and players like that i don't think i was like so engrossed but um but i'm uh, i was starting to be introduced to the game yeah so so and and i I love this because you were actually like a an american soccer fan um which is, I think, at that time, a little bit rare because most people either knew the game from Europe or it was just, it's hard to watch. And I, I remember too, the Metro Stars, I would I would go to those games as well. So when you think of U.S. soccer, is your first memory really that 1999 World Cup or was there something before that, like where you, um, you kind of put together, okay, I could maybe represent my country and this is, um, this is a thing I could do? I think my first, um, I guess, realization of what U.S. soccer was all about was the 94 World Cup. I remember Alexi Lalas. I remember that red hair. I remember Tony Miola. Tony Miola is a New Jersey guy. So we had a lot of pride. Actually, one of my childhood friends, her mom was like his teacher in elementary school. So it was like, oh my gosh, you've taught Tony Miola. Um, and I got, I subscribed to a magazine called Soccer Junior and Soccer Junior would have like posters inside. So, um, I know him now, Eric Lamalda. I told Eric Lamalda the first time that I met him, I was like, you would be shocked to know that for like throughout my adolescent years, you were on a poster next to my bedside table. <laughs> That's not creepy at all. <laughs> and he was like, hey, yeah, loved Eric Lamalda. He's doing like a side volley. Um, so I, I loved the U.S. soccer guys. I had pictures of them in my bedroom even before uh, pictures of Mia Hamm in that 99 World Cup. Really cool and interesting. And I can imagine too, it, it's, it's a really neat to think how much that's come full circle because I can't even begin to imagine how many players have and have had pictures of you and you've been that for them. Um, so just talking about you as a player specifically, how would you describe what made you most special? Because obviously you were, you were that kid, you were at these games, you said, Oh, I want to be there. Maybe that set you apart a little bit, but I mean, the, the list of your accomplishments and what you were actually able to do and the longevity um, with which you were able to perform at the highest level, like what qualities as a player allowed for that? Well, thanks for saying that. First of all, 
Um, I think that, well, one, I was always blessed with a good athletic platform. I think from, you know, age five being at summer camps and stuff like that. Like I was always one of the fastest players. Um, and then later on in my career, I realized that I had a good aerobic capacity too, or my fitness was, was good. I think good's an understatement. I've seen you in the beat pass. <laughs> <laughs> We've been on the line running back and forth many a times. And yeah. Um, so I think, I do think that there's a, a bit of a genetic factor. Like, like I said, my dad was a track runner. So I think my athletic platform was good from an early age, but I also think that I had this like fire in this competitiveness that was unmatched, at least to any like young girls that I had kind of come across in my school, in my um, club career. I was just so competitive, like so competitive to the point where like I would get upset. Like if I, missed a chance if I lost a game. Um, and I think early on, like I had to learn some coping mechanisms because I was one of those kids that like before the game was over, if we were losing, I would like essentially like overheat. And like, I don't even, I don't know if it would be defined as a panic attack, but I think um, now I know a little bit more about it. Like, I think I would be pretty close. So um, I learned um, how to sort of keep those things in check. But like I was um, a really fierce competitor. I think, I think that it went back to me having older brothers and wanting to impress them and wanting to feel like I could hang. And, um, I got, I felt a lot of love, I think from those early ages of being a top athlete and being able to compete with the boys and being a winner. And once you kind of taste those things, I think that it, um, really drives you for more. And I think because, I had those things in the beginning. Um, it really kind of kept me hungry and it kept me um, competitive. I, and even in rec soccer, I had a guy, a friend named Jono, uh, one of my male friends that was around my age. And he played obviously with the boys side. I played with the girls side, but we had a competition who could score more, more goals in a season. And I must've been six years old and I was already competing for a scoring record and like devastated if I didn't beat him. Uh, so I think that I had this competitive nature that was somewhat um, borderline obsessive, but um, also that kind of kept me going when when other players would want to stop. Yeah, it's it's interesting to hear you talk about that because there are some qualities that just define who someone is. And that like that wasn't just something that set you apart from other young kids. This is literally something that made you special at the top, top level as well. So that just shows how intense that quality is. It's not like, oh, once you got there and there, everybody had that, like that's still was a differentiator from what I've seen being on teams with you. So really cool. Um, just one more question kind of about, you know, technique and different qualities within the game. Is there a technique or some quality that you've seen in another player that in particular, you're like, oh, if I could have that one quality from them, that would have, you know, even taken me to the next level. And if so, who, who do you have in mind that you would steal it from? <laughs> Oh yeah. 100%. I think, uh, yeah, you learn, you learn when you're teammates with people, um, why this game is so beautiful because everybody brings their individual talents to the table. Um, but looking at some of my like U S comrades, I think players that were like played similar positions to me that I look at and I think, okay, they had a little bit more of this. I had a little bit more of this. I'd say Megan Rapino and Tobin Heath are two players that, um, you know, I think early on in their careers, they probably learned a lot from me. Later on in our careers, I would learn a lot from them and wish that I could do some of the things that they could do. Uh, Megan Rapino, I would say specifically, I, I look at her like set piece service and delivery. And I think I tell kids now, like, why not become a set piece specialist? Oh, you've told like, me that many times over the years, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. I yelled at you and you were like, I want to score one in five free kicks. I'm like, what about one in three? Why are you setting yourself one in five? Anyways, I, I just think that like if I had spent some more time with that, um, that it could have been a real weapon for me. And now that I'm on like the coaching side of things, um, when you are making your team sheet, all these things come into play while you're putting players on the field. And to just have Megan Rapinoe's ability to like bend corners with speed um, uh, and, and free kicks as well. I, I just think is such an asset of hers. 
And it doesn't matter if she gets older. It doesn't matter if she's not 100% healthy because that's something that like is becomes associated with you that coaches know that you can have. So that's one thing. And I think for Tobin Heath, I mean, the obvious is Tobin's one of the most skillful players to come out of U.S. soccer um, history. And I think that uh, her like love of the ball um, when she was younger in particular is something that like just elevated her throughout her entire career because I mean, I, Back in the day, like she didn't play another sport. She loved soccer. She watched soccer from a very young age. She was just like more of a soccer head than I was. I think at very like formative years of her life and like when she was growing and things like that. And I think that it, um, I think that it gave her a platform to be able to control and deal with any ball that was kind of coming her way. Whereas for me, it was like more of a challenge. I, I worked hard on my first touch, like later in my career, but I don't think that I had some of the fundamentals from a very early age that Tobin did. And I think that eventually um, she added a lot of layers to her game. And it was almost kind of too late for me to acquire some of those um, early stages of ball control and mastery that Tobin had from a young age. So I would say that those, those two... Um, or players that I, I looked for as, as I was a little bit jealous of their skill sets. You know, there, there's so many interesting things you just brought up in, in what you said. And I think a big piece of it is something you talked about with kind of like the shifting of the tides a little bit. Like these are players who came in and saw you as like, wow, I want to be where she is one day work. And then through their own experiences and maybe had experiences playing abroad that you got later on and things like that. Um, ended up doing things that now you look at on and you say, oh, I wish I could add that. And, and I think to give everyone a perspective, like when, when you started um, your national team career, you know, you were playing alongside Mia Hamm, your first training camp, Mia Hamm was there. So we're thinking like the original of U.S. soccer, then going through the 2015 World Cup, playing with Megan Rapino. Now we're talking about, you know, Tobin Heath is no longer a younger player, but these are some of your contemporaries. And then Lindsay Horan taking over the number nine. So we're getting into like modern, modern era and kind of the changing game. So you probably arguably more than anyone else were part of the biggest shift in culture over your time with the national team. How would you say you witnessed, like what did, what did you see in terms of that shift of culture from the time you came in to, you know, what it is when you kind of stepped away and are still very closely involved now? Yeah, I, I would agree. And I, I think one of um, the biggest compliments that anybody ever paid me is when I was wrapping up my international career in 2016. And I heard somebody mention me as a, a culture carrier. And what they meant by that was that like times will change with U.S. soccer um, or American soccer or the global game overall or women's sports. Um, but there are certain things about the U.S. women's national team or certain fabrics of that community that have been passed through the generations and that I was somebody that really played a big role in sort of making sure that those traditions and those standards of, of excellence were um, always brought to the table. So that was a huge compliment for me, uh, being a, a culture carrier for that very special team. So yeah, when I came on in, in the early 2000s, I mean, first of all, women's um, professional soccer wasn't really a thing. Um, you know, the WUSA uh, was just folded. Nobody kind of knew if it was going to have another chance. The, the national team was kind of like the big entity. Um, and we were doing things as a national team that who knew what they were doing in Europe. Like if we would have like eight camps a year, they would probably have two camps a year. Um, so the national team was, was everything. And so that's one thing that's, that has certainly shifted and, and it's good for the world, the women's game globally, that like the club environments are becoming more professional. Um, the attention is shifting towards like, okay, that should be your main home base. Eventually that will probably be your main source of income. That's your, you know, main training environment. But when I was kind of coming through, like the national team was that for me, um, that's where I felt home actually is when I went on training camps with the national team. It, it's funny because I think I grew up so much in hotels and so much on the road that that actually feels 
more natural to me than like actually having a home and having roots somewhere. And that actually was something that like took some adjusting when I stopped playing that I was like not getting on an airplane with my soccer bag as much and like going to training camp because I had done it like pretty much my entire, you know, youth and, and teenage and then college years. And then even as a, as an adult. So I think that that transition will eventually happen. Um, and I, I saw a lot of progress with that. I mean, I saw, you know, the WSA fold. I was part of the launch of the WPS. Um, and then that folded. And now the NWSL is is, is having a longer um, stay as, as the professional league here in the U.S. Thanks to you, by the way. Well, a I've been partner. a little part. So, so have us all who have been around. <laughs> but yeah. yeah so that, that that's a huge development. And um, I think from a stylistic point of view, I think, you know, so Anson Dorrance, who's now my boss at UNC, won the first Women's World Cup in 91. And he's very proud of the fact that he um, he was coach of the U.S. team for five years. When he got the U.S. team, they hadn't won an international game yet. And after five years, they were World Cup champions. And I think Anson's stamp on that program, even in the 90s, so we're talking 30 years ago, is actually a really special part of the DNA that has lasted this entire time. And it's because he um, he made it OK for women to compete, I think, for, from a physical standpoint, um, like the one V one duel was very important to him. People being in shape. There's stories of them sending players home after their first day of training camp that didn't pass fitness test. Just like, I'm sorry. And they got an airplane ticket and they went back home. So it was like the standard of um, of being fit and competitive was always super high. Um, and that I think, you know, winning breeds winning, right? So those were the early days, 91, uh, they won the world cup that led them to, you know, later on having success in the 99 world cup. And as we know that that just blew things up in America. So, um, yeah, like I was saying, I think that, that, that was like the, the early days, um, of the competitive nature being fitter, being faster, um, being more competitive, never say die attitude. You know, you look at players like Michelle Eakers and it's like what they were all about. Clearly the game has evolved, right? And that's, I think, where what you're getting at in terms of a, a style perspective for the U.S. national team. Now all these women across the world, like, especially with sports science, like things like that are leveling. Um, you know, uh, what distances people are covering in the U.S. compared to Europe, all that data now is like very shared. Um, so there's no secrets anymore of what people are kind of doing behind, uh, behind closed doors. Um, so now it's the, the nuances of the game are, are so much more critical. You have to have those things, but you have to be able to um, play with the ball on the ground, be creative with the way that you break teams down. Um, I think that the U S national team still uh, forever and ever will be able to play like a direct game on like, maybe anybody else, but clearly has to play, you know, an indirect possession base through the lines um, way as well and in tight spaces sometimes. So that has, um, that has certainly evolved through my time with the U S team, but uh, I still like to say that there's some pieces of that original DNA um, that are long lasting will hopefully be there for uh, three number nines down the line. Yeah, and so interesting to think about how short the history of women's soccer in this country and in the world really is. I mean, the fact that you're talking about Anson Dorrance, who essentially was part of starting women's soccer in this country, is still coaching. Do you feel concerned at all about, you know, when Anson one day retires, when, um, you know, that there is, you know, there are very few players now, you know, you you stepped away from the U.S. national team. At, the, at what point, if any point, do you feel a little bit concerned? Are there like big gaps that you see things we need to step up and do better? Or do you feel like the baton has been passed really well and, and everybody's on the right track? Well, I think that, you know, to be at the top for so long is very challenging. And it's likely, you know, it's it's very difficult to stay there for the entire time. I think I've been part of this conversation for the last 15 years, to be honest, of like, okay, is the U S team falling off is our other teams catching up. 
kind of um, narrative. And to be honest, I felt that big time, even in, um, you know, sort of the, the mid 2000s when Mia Hamm retired after the 94 Olympics. I mean, sorry, 2004 Olympics. And to be honest, like it was a ton of pressure for myself, for Abby Wambach, for even Christine Lilly and, and Christy Pierce to say like, okay, we know a, a big generation of players are gone, but we want to pass the torch. And we did a pretty good job, I think, you know, and, and I think there were some doubters in years that we maybe um, underperformed in 2000, um, let's see, 2007 World Cup. Um, but then we won the Olympics in 2008. And then in 2011, we still couldn't seal the deal at the World Cup, but we won the Olympics in 2012. Finally, we sort of checked that box in 2015. And I think that that was a big sort of like weight off my generation of players' shoulders that like we did, we did carry it in a successful way and in one that we can be proud of. Um, so I've heard that narrative for a long time in terms of like, should we be worried? Um, and I don't think we should be worried. I think the state of the game for the women's side and the men's side for that matter right now um, is in a, a really good place, is in a healthy place. Um, will we win every single tournament? Well, that will be very difficult, but I think what I can't see us falling out of the top three anytime soon, not with the player pool that we have, not with the fine coaching staff that we have. Um, so I do think that we're in a, a good place. I think there will be some transitions. I think you look at players going pro and, and skipping college like years ago, that didn't happen. It was a very linear path. And I think that there will be a lot of different paths that players might take and that might have some growing pains, but, um, I think all in all, we have a wonderful platform uh, here in the U.S. And a, and a really good player pool of really good athletes and, and, and women that like get it, that want to be part of this incredible dynasty and that, that take it seriously. I was going to say, uh, you know, that's a really in both insightful and honest answer, which I think is usually you get one side of that or the other. Um, but to acknowledge that, you know, there's kind of been that panic now for years and years, but it, it's, um, you know, we are really OK. And I think that's a good transition because I want to ask you a little bit about U.S. soccer culture in general. We're talking about both the men's and women's side, the fan base, kind of the full picture is what about um, what aspect of soccer in the U.S. do you think? is most indicative of the culture here? <laughs> um, maybe just the fact that like, that pretty big soccer fans are okay with going like four years to really like care again. I think that like the, um, the die hard game in game out club culture, um, and there's certainly a few in the NWSL and MLS. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to disrespect any fans out there. But <clears throat> these clubs, they're just not as historic as some clubs that have been around forever in Europe and in South America. So it's just not as like ingrained in the family culture, I don't think. And they're not living and dying by what happens week by week. Uh, they rally pretty good for the World Cups and maybe for the women's side, the Olympics, um, maybe they tune in for the Euro stuff like that, but, uh, just in terms of having it be part of their like week by week, like fabric of their life, I think is certainly missing. And for the first time in my life, truly, I felt it when I went over to London and played with Arsenal. Um, I felt even myself, like looking online after every men's match or like knowing the fixture list, like knowing who's coming up in one game in five games, um, knowing, you know, which players were healthy and not. And I think that that just kind of like obsession and intertwining with like, um, culture is something that that's still to come in the U S. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I, I swear you, you can see my little list of notes here of the direction I want to go with this conversation. Cause you're literally giving me the perfect segue into, it. I was going to ask you next. Well, we about, have been friends yeah, for a while. Yeah, so yeah we, I know you can read my mind. It's kind of scaring me a little bit. Um, I wanted to segue into talking to you about your time um, at Arsenal and, you know, obviously now the news just came out that Tobin is going there. So um, first of all, you know, if you had, do you have any advice that you would share with Tobin or maybe you've already shared with Tobin about, you know, what it's like there and, and how the experience is different. She's been in England um, obviously, but um, what stands out to you most that would maybe be something you'd share with Tobin about that club in particular? 
Well, I think that, you know, she knows Arsenal probably better than I do, even at this point, even having been over there for a year and a half, because she's been a supporter. Like she's, like I said earlier in, in this interview, like Tobin's a soccer head. Like she watched Arsenal in like the mid nineties in the two thousands, like Thierry Henry, Arsene Wenger, like the Invincibles. She, she probably followed that season as a young kid. Um, and that was something that I had to kind of come up to speed with. Um, so I think that instantly like Tobin will, um, there won't be a transition in terms of like finding that passion with the club. And I think that people, um, that are supporters in, in Europe, like really respect the fact of being a true supporter. I mean, truthfully, I went over as like a Manchester United fan because like Tim Howard played there and he left me tickets one time. And so then I became a Manchester United fan, but it wasn't like, I wasn't really truly a fan. I I just picked them like a lot of Americans do because whatever their games were on a little bit more than any others. But when I went over to Arsenal, I finally felt what it meant to be a true supporter. And so then I switched my alliance to Arsenal people. Like, <laughs> that's a very true supporter thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. They're like, that's the most American thing. And you've done a lot of very American things, but this might be the most American thing you've ever done. Um, actually, it's so funny that I say that. I don't know why this just came, came up, but um, one of the girls is like, you know what's such an American thing for you guys to do? It's just like when you just take on and then you just like dribble over the online by accident. Like they're like, that does not really happen that much. Like, I'm like <laughs> dribbling over the end line for a goal kick. And I was like, nah, we don't do that that much. Literally that practice, I dribbled over the end line. <laughs> and she looked at me and she's like, there it is. And anyways, but I, you know, I think that that tenacity, that competitiveness is just indicative of, you know, sometimes it, you just push the ball a little bit far. Yeah, you got the go American way. Yeah. <laughs> were, were there other observations that players made about or said about you know soccer in the u.s or did they ask you things that were kind of interesting like that oh yeah there was like clearly very some cultural differences like for me like when i think of what makes a good teammate i think of somebody that is very positive that is outspoken that almost like cheers for their teammates um maybe if you're not on the starting lineup like a good teammate to me is like somebody i can hear on the sideline, getting water, doing that kind of stuff. They do not care about that generally in England, or at least they don't let on to caring about that. For you to be a good teammate, you better be like prepared in your role. You better know what the team needs from you and you better produce like what your position is. You better produce. That's what makes you a good teammate. Um, So I sort of learned that like, it's a bit of like a, a tough love, I think. And um, I found it difficult at times and I was like in my mid thirties. So I'm talking like a, a, <laughs> a pretty mature adult. So I'm sure that it must be difficult sometimes for like a young person to go to another country. There were some times where I felt a little bit homesick because, um, I don't know. I just thought that, uh, it wasn't as like cheerful of an environment, the camaraderie maybe of the dressing room, um, wasn't the same as in America. In America, you have people doing a lot of team functions, hanging out all the time. I found it to be like a certain amount uh, business-like in, in England. And like, we were at the training ground for like long hours a day. So I think by the end of it, um, people go back home to their own lives. Uh, whereas in the U S you're kind of like, let's keep this short, sharp, do our, our meetings, training, get out of there in three hours. Whereas like, I think in, in England, at least in my um, experience, to be a professional and to be a good teammate meant like you were there for a long time. Like you were there for six, seven hours, you know, doing very diligent in your, in your rehab to video, to, to all the different things. It was very like proper, just like you would think, um, you know, stereotypical English, just very proper in the way that they went about their footballing. You know, it's interesting because hearing you talk, you've shared both things that I, in my mind, I'm like, oh, how can we get there as a U.S. soccer culture in terms of like the the fans being so deeply ingrained in their love, like true love, like live or die by their team. And then there's some things that maybe like maybe it's nice and unique to the U.S. where we have team cultures where (laughs) there's a little bit, you know, there are other ways to be a good teammate rather than just being like straight up producing on the field. So in general, do you think that... 
as a U.S. soccer culture, we should try to go in the direction of some of the more historic, um, like soccer cultures, or should we should we be blazing our own trail here, which maybe we are a little bit. I mean, I am pro America in a lot of ways, and you know, these last <laughs> few months have opened my eyes to a lot of ugly things in America. So I think that like I have taken my rose colored glasses off a little bit about some of the, the things about the U.S. that I've always loved. But I think that there's um, there's a lot to be said for um, our uniqueness. And actually, like even though the English um, created football, soccer, they have a lot of pride in that, by the way, that it started there. Um, they look towards us for a lot. For a lot, for a lot, especially on the women's side, they look, how do you, how do you become winners? How is your team chemistry so good? Um, what's your fitness and diet like? So I think that the grass is always going to be greener. We can always look there and be, you know, a little bit envious of this, but, but they're looking at us. I mean, you see even some of these men's players, like, you know, they come over to NBA games, like they're, they're, they love Hollywood. They're like obsessed with American culture. So I think on both sides, we kind of are a little bit envious of what the other one has because we don't have it. Um, so I, I like to, to hang on to that, but I do think in terms of, um, yeah, your, your, uh, your obsession with a club, I think is really critical um, and I think that if we kind of have that in the U.S., that that will go a far way because um, if that's like, if it's intertwined with your life, I think uh, that's the differentiator. That's like the obsession that they have in Europe that we are far off from. To be honest, sometimes it like goes a little bit too far in Europe, like as we see with some hooliganism or. You know, as much as I love Arsenal fan TV and like those guys, like. It's crazy. Like people's like sense of self and identity lies in their love of their football club. And I see that right now as an Arsenal supporter. I mean, people are like devastated. They're like actually depressed about Arsenal. And it's heavy. It's heavy when you put a lot into something that you can't control. But I think that that like sense of like losing yourself to something bigger um, is, is sort of what they they have in Europe that we're uh, still far off from here. So, well, first of all, do you think there, is there another sports culture in the U S that truly mimics that? Like, do we have that anywhere here or not quite? Do you think? Oh yeah. I think that there's big pockets of it with um, some NFL loyalties, maybe some college rivalries. Um, but I, I'm not convinced that it's the same level of, weaving in people's like sense of self and identity and sort of like where they come from. I think a lot of it is like an identity thing, right? It's like, well, I'm from Newcastle and there's like a certain pride of that or like Liverpool. It's like, what do you, what does it mean if you're a Liverpool fan? They attach a lot of like meaning behind it. And it sort of defines you as like an individual. Whereas I'm not quite sure that like maybe like the Pittsburgh Steelers or something like that, like maybe has like some of that kind of identity thing. But like, I just think American sports are very new uh, compared to some European clubs. And so there's not the same like history behind it. And, and your great, great grandpa didn't support a certain club. So uh, I think we can manufacture it in certain ways, but it might not be as organic and, and maybe that's okay. Yeah, it's really interesting to think about think about how long it takes for something like that to truly get ingrained. That's not something you can do through marketing or, or anything like that. So um, talking a little bit about, and you've spoken a little bit about this like transition to now and kind of the vision for the future. I'm curious to hear kind of what what where do you see this going in the US? Like how does this develop? Are we going in that direction where it's going to become closer to Europe? Are we going in another direction? Like what does soccer in the US look like 10 or 20 years from now? On the men's and women's side. Yeah. I mean, I'm bullish about it. I, I definitely am. I think um, that, you know, hosting the 2026 World Cup is a good opportunity for us. Uh, I don't think that we can uh, forget that, you know, we still have a long runway. So that hopefully this pandemic is behind us um, and we can start planning this. And by we, I mean, you know, the World Cup 
committee can really start planning a phenomenal tournament where they have the venues picked, the communities are amped up to host the world in the biggest sporting event uh, in global sport. So I think that that will definitely help. I think our demographics are are shifting in America. Um, the percentage of uh, Latino population is is increasing every year. And, um, and with that, they're bringing their love of the game. Um, so I think that uh, the demographic will um, change to be real soccer fans. And I think that, you know, in, you know, there might be some NFL fans that might uh, hit me up on Twitter after this, but I think in the next 10, 15 years, there's going to be a real decrease in uh, participation for, for American football, just from a health perspective and a concussion perspective. And I think that, you know, the, once the participation numbers um, shift from those sports and you become a, you know, when you're an adult, you become a fan of it. So I do, I am bullish that like the American soccer fan is growing. I don't feel like it's like back in the nineties when I talked about going to, I went, I went to like a sporting goods store and stood in line for Tony Miola, like, signature on my Eric Winalda soccer junior magazine. Um, that, but that was like, that was like a niche following. It was like, you are part of this. And it was kind of special because you're like, you're a soccer fan. So it was sort of like this small gathering of really hardcore people. And now it, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot bigger. Um, so I think it's, it's becoming more mainstream. Um, but when, you know, it just needs to be very normalized to like see, Soccer on Sports Center to see it on highlights, um, and we're not necessarily there yet from a media perspective. But I think the the tide is turning in terms of the people. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point about the demographic. Like, you know, right now our soccer demographic. If you go sit at most games or go to most youth soccer landscapes, it doesn't actually reflect what the country looks like. So there's a huge portion of our country who is not yet part of what you know we're thinking of as a soccer landscape who will change the, the nature of it all. Um, so it's a, a really good point, I think. And, you know, so we talked about, um, well, first of all, do you still have that sign, the sign soccer junior? <laughs> Is it in that room framed on the other side? I don't think wall? that that made like my like 12th move. I think that like fell, fell. Fair. Sorry, with, Tony. Maybe Sorry, in Kansas Tony. City. Maybe it's in our, yeah. our dumpster still that they never took out the recycling. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, so we talked a little bit about, you know, what it will take for the, the U.S. women to stay at the top. How realistically, how long do you think, how far away are we from the U.S. men's national team being in the semifinal of a World Cup? Let's say I think winning is a little bit winning sometimes a chance, but I feel like top four finish is like you are really top in the world. How how far are we from that? Yeah. Oh, man. Great question. I like a lot of things that Greg Berhalter has done. To be fair, and wearing my Carolina shirt right now, I got to give a shout out to Greg. He's also a Tar Heel, and he married um, a woman that played here at Carolina. So um, I'm going to back the Burhalter clan to the end. I think that he's done a really nice job, and what an amazing crop of young players right now. You know, led by of course Pulisic, McKinney, those guys. I mean, really bright stars that are doing things day in, day out, again, day in and day out, week in and week out standards of high, having to perform at like the highest level. So I think that that's a, a differentiator and, and not to be um, unfair, I think, to other leagues throughout the world and especially here in the U.S., but to just have that demand for um, for eliteness on a week in, week out level will just raise the national team. I mean, now we're in the top 10 from the last FIFA ranking. So we're already at 10. So you're asking how... In theory, do we get from 10 to four and in, in how long? Um, I think we can get there for 2026. I really, really do. I mean, what that would mean is that we have a couple of big wins every year from now until that point and that we do really well at the World Cup that we're hosting. And I think that that is um, that that's possible. I remember and not to call you out, you know, uh -oh. time, but like maybe what was it, four or five years ago when we beat Spain, our men's team beat the Spanish national team. And like, we kind of were like in disbelief. We weren't disappointed, but we're just like- Oh, I was like, like that shouldn't happen. I'll be honest. Yeah, right? it was like I kind was of like, bizarro confused. world, right? Like you look at like Xavi, uh, Iniesta, like um, 
getting beaten by the U.S. men's team. And we were like kind of um, taken by surprise. But I think that those days of like being the being the like minnow and thinking it's funny when we knock off like big teams, that has to change. And that is even comes from me, you know, like we're a top 10 FIFA like participant now. We have to be able to say that, believe it, um, not accept anything else. And, um, and yeah, I guess just like not think that we can't hang with the big boys anymore because clearly we're in the top 10, so we can, um, but, uh, yeah. So to answer your question, I think we can get there by 2026. Yeah. What about you? So, uh, you know, that's a pretty bold prediction, but I agree with you only because if you think about how quickly that shift has happened, it's the, the reality is like, now we see our players playing day in and day out with the big timers. Whereas before, I mean, if we're being totally honest, when we would have those conversations, like we talked about with the game against Spain, I don't even know what year that was, but, um, you know, these are like world legends. We were watching play against what I felt like were our U S guys. And it was two different worlds. And now I think we've seen those worlds, um, intermingle, not just with one player, two players. We have a nice group of, of men now playing at, at some of the top clubs in the world. So to me, that's the differentiator. And I totally think it can be possible. Like what actually happens when you get to the world cup and a, in a tournament environment, who knows, but to be, I guess, my question was what you answered, which is to be at that caliber. Like, what how, what does that take? And I do think it's possible by that time, especially because you think of like, you know, um, what it takes. You have young players coming up here now who have watched Americans go do it and go, you know, be some of the best players in the world, uh, which before was not the case. So now I think we're going to see bigger, bigger crowds of that happening. Um, how quickly? I don't know, but I think it, it kind of spirals. So maybe quickly. So I don't think, I don't think you're off base. I would agree with you there. Um, so kind of like last little direction here, and then just talking even more into the future. And then I have a couple, um, very pointed wrap up questions for you that I think you'll have fun with, but so, so, you know, we're talking about the future 10, 20 years from now, maybe sooner, like when the U S men are kind of really making a name on the world stage at like top team in the world, what role do you see yourself playing in all this in the soccer landscape? Um, how involved or not do you want to be? And then I have kind of a secondary question based on that, but I'm curious to hear kind of who is Heather O'Reilly in 10 years in the soccer world? <laughs> I think that's a great question. I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, I would uh, like to say that I will be very involved. Um, I think that like, you know, these last couple of years uh, have been a time of reflection for me as I, you know, I retired from international play in 2016 and then retired um, kind of completely as a footballer in 2019. Um, although, as we talk about, yeah, I'll always be a footballer, just not a professional one. So that has. Yes, that's what we remind ourselves all the time. Yes, exactly. I'll always be a footballer. Um, so, yeah, clearly, like this is a transition time in my life. And in any kind of transition time, you reflect upon <clears throat> where you've been and where you want to go. Uh, the people that you surround yourself with um, and how you spend your time and energy. And I think that, you know, the soccer environment really ha has made me the person that I am. So many of my richest relationships are through this game. Um, could, is there a lot of other things in this world to like get involved with? Sure. But I, I have found a passion. I just happened to find it when I was like a young kid that people I think search for, for a lot of their lives. Um, so I don't think I want to take that for granted and I don't want to take for granted um, the community that I found myself in, whether it is us soccer or here at UNC um, of people that like really love this game and, and look out for each other. And um, so to be, to, to answer a question, I think I'll be very involved in what um, Avenue. I don't know. So right now, currently, I'm sort of splitting my time. I'd say three ways in particular. One, I'm a mom. Uh, you do see little, my notes. That's my next topic to ask you. Yeah. About. <laughs> no, we're yeah. we're just one yeah. one one heart. Yeah. Um, I'm a mom. Uh, I have a little baby named Will. He's 14 months old. He just started walking. Very fun. And you can't see like down here. That looks weird, but down <laughs> here. I have a pregnant belly. Um, so I have a, a baby coming in December as well. So this is, you know, a, a time of my life where I'm raising a baby. I have this other baby coming. 
busy times with my like growing family. So that's my one sort of responsibility right now. Secondly, um, I'm coaching at, at North Carolina, my alma mater, um, under the legendary coach Anson Dorrance, who we talked about uh, a, a little bit earlier. So I'm just really trying to kind of soak it up right now from a coaching perspective. I'm working on my coaching badges. I have my UEFA B for my time when I was over there. And I'm in the midst right now of my U.S. soccer B uh, license, which is important to have um, just as you kind of go up the coaching ladder to sort of check those boxes. So um, I'm, I'm taking everything in um, and, and seeing if this is something that I really want to take seriously and pursue. And then the third area is, is sort of uh, media, media work. Um, I've worked with, with Fox last World Cup. I uh, hope to do that again for the next one, which is in Australia for the women. Um, and I work with the BBC, do a radio show uh, and, and different you know, events such as this. So um, kind of continuing to, to evolve as a, as a soccer pundit, I guess, um, while I kind of keep up my coaching. So uh, I assume it would be in, in one of those uh, categories, uh, which one I'm not certain yet. Uh, but you can be sure that this game has not seen the end of me, whether uh, you like it or not. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. Um, so, yeah, you, you're talking about your kids, you know, if or maybe I should say when they play, like what's your hope for them? Are you how intense of a soccer mom are you feeling like you, you are already? <laughs> <laughs> well, I really hope that they play soccer. I know that a lot of like pair, a lot of young parents are like, oh, I don't really care what they get into as long as they're happy. Like. I want my kid to play sports. I do. If they don't want to, certainly I love them like unconditionally and I will get behind whatever they're into. But like, I would love if he loved soccer um, because, it, you know, it is such a passion of mine and it can bring so much joy to your life. And so I hope that he feels like the way that I did. So yeah, I hope he's a little soccer player. Um, I don't think I'm gonna, I don't think I'm going to be a crazy soccer mom in terms of like hawking over him and calling his coach if he doesn't get appropriate playing time and things like that. I, I would hope that my experiences um, would help me, you know, be uh, create an environment where he knows that he's loved and supported no matter what. Um, and that success for me is, is working hard and treating people. Well, uh, I think that if you do those things, um, good things will come your way. And so if I can, can let him know that, um, that's the only, that's the only way I won't be, uh, too pleased with him. If he's not a hard worker and he's not treating people well, that's when he'll get in a little bit of trouble, but, uh, not if he joins this team or that team or, or plays that instrument, whatever, whatever it is. Um, but I do need him to check those two boxes. Well, I can't believe him coming from your DNA that there would be much else we'd see from him. But probably in seven years, we got to have a 2v2 battle, uh, you and Will against me and Aria. <laughs> okay, so three uh, wrap-up questions. First thing that comes to your mind on these, uh, what's most American about U.S. soccer? <laughs> the we believe that we will win chant. That is a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> love it, though. I love it. That's a wonderful answer. Um, and dribbling over the end line by accident. Apparently, that's one we didn't know. <laughs> What's the greatest soccer market that no one knows about or is yet to have a team? Well, we played together in Kansas City, and I know that sporting is, is, is big there and now has the women's team. But like whenever there's a huge event, World Cup, Euros, Kansas City shows up, which is always like somewhat surprising to me. So I think that it's like an untapped... Uh, still, we can say that it's an untapped um, market for soccer crazies. Yeah, Kansas City does refer to themselves as the soccer capital of the U.S., which I was very confu confused about until we lived and played there. Then I was like, I, you know, I see it. I see yeah. why they, why they. Yeah, I think that Kansas City needs to fill in other people around the country and around the world if they are the soccer, indeed, the soccer capital. <laughs> need to make that public information. <laughs> um, Okay. Well, you might've kind of already answered this, but what's the most American soccer market and why? And you're not saying that as a negative. You're saying that just in general. However you want to take it. <laughs> um, I might say here in North Carolina, when I came back from Arsenal and I was like used to like 
meat pies and like real like traditional like stadium fair. And then I joined back with the North Carolina Courage and it was like the Southern accent, like get your bow jingles at halftime. I was like, wow, uh, we're not in Kansas anymore. I guess literally we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, this is a different, a different type of um, soccer experience, football experience. And, and I was used to in London. So my jump from London to Cary, North Carolina was pretty dramatic. Quite Not in a bad way. It was just different. Fair, fair. Well, I, I always, I always love talking to you, whether it's just on a random call between feeding the kids or um, whatever it is, but this is really, I appreciate you sharing like some, I think insight beyond what we can know about you um, and your views just from having watched you play or looking on Wikipedia at your bio. So thank you so much. Um, love the conversation. And I, I'm definitely excited to listen back myself and hear it again. Oh, cool. Well, thanks for having me and good luck with the rest of this podcast. I'm sure that you're going to have some great uh, guests and uh, everybody always respects your voice and um, what you've done for the game. Yeah, as well. So I can't think of a better host. So well, well thank done. you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. <laughs>